All right. Today we got Mark Steves in the house. How you doing, Mark? Excellent. It's a pleasure to hey, be here. Hey, I just said your last name. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I go by a bunch of different names. The more uh, options people have, the more confusing the trail is. So <laughs> Mark Steves, Mystic Mark, Mark Palmer, whatever you hear, that's me. Gotcha, man. Gotcha. So I just want to let the audience know that we have a real life Nephilim in the house today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, dude, like you're, you're so stinking tall, man. Like, holy crap. I, 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 I nailed it too. When we were, uh, when we were chatting one time, I, I forget, I saw you in a picture or something. I said, dude, like you're like six, eight or something. You're like, yep, you're not far off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the exact height. I think you saw a picture of me and my mentor Amos. Uh, and yeah, it's by all appearances, I'm a giant. It's no coincidence that uh, I'm tracking this information down. I think people uh, won't be surprised to learn that we're going to be talking about giants today. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just like research for your family tree. You're doing it all. So, uh, exactly. To find out where great grandpa's buried. <laughs> absolutely. It's Smithsonian. Check there first. <laughs> Uh, listen, man, uh, before we get into the information today, uh, let the people know who you are and where you're from and stuff. Uh, this is the first time you've been on my show. I've been on your show several times and, uh, it's nice to be able to return the favor. So, uh, let the people know where you're from and what you're all about. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a pleasure having you on my show. I think almost four times, uh, if, if I'm, counting correctly, four times or, or three times you've been on my show, the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast, and I'm sure folks listening to the confessionals can relate to that. I was uh, one of you uh, many years ago and still am to this day a, a listener of the confessionals and a supporter now. I recently uh, signed up for the website, so uh, join me over there, folks. But my show is called My Family Thinks I'm Crazy. It was inspired by well, a long life of being on the fringe, being interested in things that necessarily <laughs> uh, go against the grain and, and possibly are a little bit uh, weird. Uh, I've just always had a, a propensity for that. And around 2019, I met Sam Tripoli and uh, just as a fan and one thing led to another. I got invited onto his Patreon podcast and that got me invited back on four or five times. And then I eventually did his podcast zero and he asked me to help him out with the booking. So I started working with Sam on his podcast zero and eventually tinfoil hat. And now I have the pleasure of working with Sam uh, on his show tinfoil hat, which I was Again, like the confessionals, a huge fan of, um, still am. So my journey from just listener to podcaster, I always like to point that out because, you know, folks listening, you may be working a job like I once had a delivery guy. Tony's been a delivery guy. You know, you're listening to podcasts all day. If you're like us and you have something to say, don't be shy. Get on the mic, give it a shot, and who knows? Maybe you'll quit your job and start something new. Maybe you'll start Merkel Media like Tony did. You know, I mean, look at how much work Tony's put in and and how it's paying off. So, you've been an inspiration to me, Tony. Um, for folks who don't know, I book Tinfoil Hat, and of course, my family thinks I'm crazy is the name of my podcast, and uh, I have a couple other podcasts that have grown out of that podcast, and I hope to be sort of focusing on one of those today. That's the podcast titled Esoteric America. And the idea of this show is to invite folks on to share their research, right? Not necessarily the same as your show where you have folks coming on to share their, you know, incredible encounters or compelling stories. We have we invite folks to go and do some digging, look into the history of their hometown, their backyard, wherever they find themselves, and to start collecting these stories. And, you know, we've done some really, really incredible episodes from Baudette, Minnesota, to Anderson, Indiana, to uh, Spring Green or Spring Glen, Wisconsin. I mean, there's so many little pockets of America that, you know, go unnoticed. Of course, there's the 
there's the famous Mothman sightings, there's the Loch Ness sightings, there's the Bigfoot hot spots, but really no matter where you look, and it's not just America, no matter where you look, you'll find something weird. It's just about having the curiosity and sometimes the bravery to go after it, you know, and, and that's kind of been the, the funnest part of esoteric America is to meet all these great people uh, who are interested in the same thing. As a matter of fact, you introduced me to three uh, young men who are right in line, literally with everything I'm doing. Uh, they kind of inspired this exchange in a, in a small way. When I saw the Appalachian boys on the show, I said, well, geez, I'm, I'm kind of like the Northern Appalachian guy up here in New England. Let me tell these dudes what's going on up here. So shout out to Justin, Lance, and Ryan. Those dudes rock. Thank you for introducing me to them. Uh, and I, I think they uh, are another example of people who are out there digging up places, not literally digging up, but seeking things that, for the most part, the average person doesn't really even consider real. You know, they think, you know, Myths and legends are just things that you find in storybooks. No, they're in your backyard, folks. Myths and legends are for the making. You know, you may not, you may not find something, you know, like a treasure chest full of gold, but you're going to have a story. Even if you come, <laughs> come home with your hands empty, you're going to have a story. And as human beings, story is, you know, I want to say it's the most important. I don't even think that does it justice. I think storytelling is one of the most human things ever. And your show is a testament to that. All the amazing stories that you've collected on this podcast. I'm very honored to, to be able to add to that uh, amazing collection while also hopefully giving folks out there who haven't seen a Bigfoot or Mothman, or any of these fantastic creatures, uh, a reason to still be excited about going out. I mean, I'm not saying you won't see a Bigfoot hunting down some of these stone structures. Who knows? I've heard stories that Bigfoot actually like hanging out near some of these stone structures we're going to talk about. But I think there is an energy. There's an energy out there in the landscape that we can connect with. It's human. It's ordained by God. You know, it's not some devil crap that we need to be afraid of. There's an energy in nature that when we commune with, it shares its gifts with us. And that gift may be different for each individual, right? So I'm kind of on my soapbox here, but uh, hopefully all of what I just said will make sense uh, as we start getting into the material here. Yeah, absolutely, man. So yeah, I, I think the um I think this show and I I try to get the show to embody my spirit as a person. Uh and I honestly don't feel like the show accurately represents me. And it's mainly because I still have a hard time defining what makes me tick on the inside. But if I could define it, I would say mystery. Uh, there's a reason why we, we have these people telling these stories because they're very mysterious. And, uh, it's one of those things where, like you said, storytelling is such a human thing. Uh, it's such a, it's, it's something that we can, we can, uh, pass on through the generations and it lets you connect to an individual, uh, on a, a much more personal level than somebody saying that I researched this topic of ghosts and let me tell you what it is kind of thing. Uh, just letting people say, hey, I had this experience with a dog man and this is what I went through. And you can draw um, understanding from the human nature of the experience. And um, <clears throat> But it's very mysterious, the t these topics. We don't know how they work. We don't know wh wh where these things come from and, and what they're here for. Uh, are they natural? Are they not interdimensional? All these things. And along those lines of that idea of mystery and hunting down mystery is the same uh, energy and vein that gets me up and running when it comes to looking for lost treasure 
looking for ancient land sites where ancient people were, architecture, forgotten things that exist today deep in the woods. Uh, those are kind of things that just get me going because it's the mystery of life. I think if I could embody the show the best, it would be just to encompass mystery. Things that make you just sit there and be like, that's amazing. Like, How is that even possible? How did we go through the woods all these years and never see these structures or where we saw them, but we just never thought about them the way we think about them now? And that's kind of like how you're going to be taking us today with these uh, these more me- megalithic type structures in the New England area, right? Very well said. Absolutely. I uh, I hope to share people share with people not only the mystery but the me- methodology. Let me explain. So this story that I'm about to tell it starts with an idea, as every story does. Uh, and the idea was not mine. It was my girlfriend's idea. She's traveled all over the world, and synchronicity brought us together in our hometown, the place where we were both born. Me, you know, I'm a I'm a slug on a log. I never go anywhere. Like I drive my car around like a little bug. I never fly. I never get on boats. Anything. I'm I'm in my New England region. You know, I'm very comfortable here. She's the opposite. She's been to Tahiti. She's been to Australia. She's been to Africa, Europe, you know. And she said to me, you know, I've been to all these places. I don't know anything about where I'm from. And it doesn't, you know, I don't feel good about traveling because when I meet people and they ask me where I'm from, I barely have anything to say. And, you know, that's her perspective. My perspective was a little similar. Like, you know, I've been learning about all these mysterious places like the Great Pyramids and the Pyramid at Teotihuacan and the mounds and all these amazing things that I haven't ever visited. What's going on in my own backyard? And uh, we we set out to to do this. I mean, it was sort of haphazard in the way it unfolded, but it was synchronistic nonetheless. And, and maybe if I share the sort of uh, story that got me here, that'll help sort of uh ingratiate the mystery and not not make you know i don't want it to be so research based i like what you said there so it all started with an interview on my podcast episode 52 and we spoke to a woman who describes herself as a galactic walk-in she's someone who had a very traumatic life-threatening incident uh that occurred to her her original self decided she didn't want to be in this body anymore and a new soul so to speak entered that physical space and became aurora that's her story that's how she identifies as a galactic walk-in and it was a really really compelling conversation that we had with her Uh, But one of the things that she told us was that she spent a lot of time in Woodstock, New York, and there was a vortex there. And I heard that and I was immediately a a little bit stunned, super curious, but I had thought of a random drive that I did during the pandemic. You know, we were all locked down and one of my pastimes was to just get in my car and drive because there was hardly any traffic at that point in time. So I drove up to Woodstock. This was before I met my girlfriend. And I I took some pictures. You know, I I saw this mountain that kind of drew my eye and I went home. Didn't really do much. Now, upon hearing that there's a vortex there, those memories started coming back to me. Oh, remember that mountain you saw? And oh, remember that weird eagle statue? So Tara and I, we drove up to Woodstock and, you know, Woodstock's kind of taken over by commercialism. It's not the hippie, you know, uh, epicenter that it used to be. It's it's a lot of shops and like fancy cafes and, you know, it's the same story, different town. Um, It's happened to a lot of places that used to be cool, but Woodstock still maintains its spiritual energy somehow. And it had some really amazing bookstores. So we walk into the bookstore, we're digging around, and I find a book titled Spirit in Stone. And this is the book that set us off on this whole journey, man. 
And it's introduced us to things that I could not have imagined were possible or even present. So we find this book by Glenn Kreisberg, Spirit in the Stone. And immediately what drew me was the map in the center of the book, a long line that stretched from Long Island in New York up through Connecticut into the Great Lakes. For folks who haven't heard I'm from Connecticut, I live in Connecticut, I'm born here. Um, and the Hammond Asset line carves straight through Connecticut. It's this ley line of some kind. It's this, uh, you know, man made drawn line. It's not a physical line that you'll see if you were standing there, you know, in the physical space. Uh, but the line is there. And why they drew this line is because all along the line, there are hundreds of Native American stone structures that have not been explained, nor have they been cataloged up until the point that this book was written. And their primary explanation for these stone structures is that they're aligned to the equinox. They're aligned to the, the spring and summer, or I'm sorry, the spring and fall equinox. Now, this is kind of a tremendous uh, feat to pull off considering, you know, this line stretches through several states <laughs> and goes almost incredibly straight the whole time. Uh, not to mention there's several strange sites along this line, one of which is not too far from Woodstock. So sure enough, we were on the Hammond Asset line when we found this book. Uh, also, Woodstock, I should point out, the center of town, the circle that makes the center of town, is also aligned with the Hammond Asset line, almost as if the town of Woodstock was built to mirror this relationship between the stone structures and the line of equinox. So here we have ancient stone structures and a relatively recently built city, town, conforming to this non-obvious, you know, sort of hidden uh, function of astronomy on the landscape. Now, the Native Americans who lived here were obviously agricultural. They needed to have a calendar of some kind uh, and have, you know, the ability to make accurate predictions. So they use stone structures like this to pull that off. But I don't think it was limited to just utilitarian purposes. We have authors like Paul Devereaux who talk about the intaglios that are all across, well, the United States, Central America, South America. And while the intaglios are a little bit different than what we find on the Hammond Asset Ley Line. It's the same concept of stones on the landscape in a shape and within a ceremonial context. And what Paul Devereaux discovered is that some of these intaglios, they're also known as the Nazca Lines. If you've heard of the Nazca Lines, the, the you know scientific name for those are intaglios. Well, the legend about these is that a shaman would walk the path of the intaglio. So if it was shaped like a monkey, he would walk the outline of a monkey. If it was shaped like a bird, he would walk the outline of a bird. And this would create a, a transformational state within that shaman, potentially. Now, Fast forward or, or let's zoom over to this part of the world again. Along the Ham and Asset ley line, we have essentially what's known as the gate of the gods or the, the stairways of the gods, the mountains of the gods. And that's the Catskill Mountains. There's 12 peaks. Different tribes have different names for what I just described, but essentially it's uh a series of mountains that each are higher than the rest. And it would be a sort of rite of passage for a man to follow the line, the spirit line up this mountain to reach, well, 
whichever peak he could reach. You know, obviously, if you reach the highest one, you know, that was a lot more impressive than reaching the sixth highest one, right? So there was a whole dichotomy, a hierarchy through the landscape itself. This is all taking place potentially as far back as 12,000 years ago. I mean, some of these tribes have archaeological evidence that dates them that far back. Now, let's sort of shift focus a little bit. When we look at these Native American stone structures, we have to take into account that some of them don't fit the common archetype for what we consider Native American. Uh, Some of them conform more to what we would see in England, in Ireland, in Scotland, these dolmens and standing stones. And Barry Fell, who the mainstream considers a pseudo-archaeologist, I have read his work. I don't think he's a pseudo-archaeologist based on his books. He sounds like any other archaeologist in the way he goes about looking these things up and and positing his hypothesis. And he's found evidence to show that not only were there Scandinavian, not only were there Irish, not only were there Welsh and English, there was Egyptian, there was Iberian. So you have all these different cultures, not only coming to America, but leaving evidence behind you know, in the form of hieroglyphics, petroglyphs, these kind of things. This is occurring all over the United States over a series of the last thousand, two thousand years. So this is all before Columbus. You know, we have Irish uh, monks coming here. We have uh, the Welsh Prince Madoc coming here. We have the Templars, Scott Walter's written a bunch about them. So clearly there's a much larger story that's been left out of our history books. There's a lot going on here in America that for maybe political reasons or racial reasons is they've been just wiped from our record. Uh, the, the history of these Irish monks and the Scandinavians and even as far back in time as Phoenicians, you know, Phoenicians coming here and potentially taking copper out of the Great Lakes. Now, the Hammonasset Ley Line connects Long Island Sound with the Great Lakes, and it has all these stone structures along this line. Some might think that that's a a path of some kind. It may be even a, a marker saying like, okay, if you make it to the east coast of the Atlantic, you can follow this line into the Great Lakes or vice versa. If you were in the Great Lakes, you didn't have a ship, you couldn't get back to the ocean, you can follow that. You know, there there is a way to to follow the St. John River down through the Great Lakes uh, and make it into the the mid interior of the country from the Atlantic Ocean. And we even think that people have then gone from the Great Lakes down the Mississippi and out the Gulf of Mexico. So clearly there's the trade routes there. There's the the Gulf Stream and the currents sort of allow for this sort of thing to take place. To me, I think you know when you're when you're researching, it's important to, to not get bogged down in the information. What's important is to follow your intuition. So all of that background information I just gave, let's put that aside for now. I find Spirit in the Stone, you know, a lot of the stuff I just talked about, Glenn, he doesn't go that far. He doesn't say, you know, Irish people built this ham and asset line or Europeans built it. He doesn't go that far. Um, but it's important to Take all the information that you can get and kind of let it all sit in front of you before you go and make a a decision like, oh, well, it must have been this person or any sort of conclusion. I don't have any conclusions really yet, but we take the information we got from the Spirit in the Stone book, 
pass it around, share it with friends. And a friend, Mike Wan, who I highly recommend you have him on this show. He said, you got to pick up a book called The Gaia Matrix. I said, okay. I ordered it. We got it in the mail. And of course, he recommended this because of all the, you know, obsession, the talk that I had over the ham and asset line. So he said, oh, you should get the Gaia Matrix. It has a bunch of uh, those ley lines in New England. And I had never seen a New England like ley line map before, a, a map of this area with ley lines on it. Well, Tony, we get this book and sure enough, Peter Shampoo's uh, chakra ley line, that's his name for it. He, he named it the chakra ley line. It goes right through my hometown. Not only does it go right through my hometown, it goes right through the only part of the state where you can't get cell service. It's my favorite part of the state of Connecticut. I used to drive there all the time after work because it's just so beautiful. And you go up there and drive onto this mountain. You could see this big reservoir underneath the mountain. I'd go there all the time, just instinctively, you know, sensing something special about that place. Sure enough. It's on this ley line that another researcher who's far more experienced than myself, I've interviewed him a couple of times on my show. You know, he, he put this together in his book several years ago. And here we are on this journey, trusting our intuition and this information just keeps appearing. You know, first it was, Hey, this ley line cuts through your state. Now it's, hey, this ley line cuts through your hometown, you know, and I'm just sort of like soaking it all in and, and trying not to let the, the synchronicity spin me out because it, it can feel, um, well, it can feel like you're on, you're on this sort of like, uh, ego trip sometimes with the synchronicities because they're, they're a little bit too good to be true sometimes. And also they, they also can kind of get you into this state of mind of like, Oh my gosh, I'm the chosen one, which is like the ego trip, but a little more like with a spiritual excuse built into it. So you can kind of like not feel so ashamed of, <laughs> but I, I think that's, you know, my, my humble New Englander kind of like beat myself up approach, like has always kept me, uh, close to the refresh button. What I mean by that is anytime I'm getting that ego trip or that feeling of like, whoa, this is important. I must be important. uh, I hit the refresh button because that's not where the insights come. They don't come from when you're on your high horse. They don't come from when you put yourself on the pedestal. They come from when you get all of that out of your mind and you just focus on what's in front of you. So we find this book, The Gaia Matrix, and Along that chakra ley line <clears throat> is a third point and a fourth point and a fifth point and a sixth point going all the way up to Canada, right? This ley line goes all the way up to Canada and he kind of points out this is where the energy sort of flows, right? It flows up this line, but it gathers at these points, right? Because these ley lines, they're not static. They're not linear. They're almost like a vine, the way a vine will bloom in one area with a flower and a sort of circle will come from that pattern that's for the most part linear, uh, you'll have these bloom points, right? So that's how you should think of this ley line is there's the linear aspect that's like the vine that's kind of connecting the various parts of the, the plant body. And then there are like the flowers, which are not only giving off energy, but also attracting energy as well. Um, so we drove up to Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. Now, Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts is on Peter's ley line. It's also this, you know, nice little town. We go in the bookstore, of course, because that's how these synchronicities keep moving forward is by going to the bookstore, especially a used bookstore. Don't waste your time at Barnes and Noble. No offense to Barnes and Noble or any other chain stores, but used bookstores are, are key for this kind of thing. And, uh, we find an amazing book called The Manitow. And I have it right next to me. Uh, Manitow. A fantastic book that 
really expands on so many of the questions we were asking at that point in time. And and really, the, the information in this book is so dense that I'm still making my way through it. But here we go. We have this link of the three books, Spirit in the Stone, Gaia Matrix, and Manitou. And you know, for me, a book nerd, it's like, well, of course I'm buying books, but I just, you can't dismiss the causality there where one book led to the other and led to the other. And they all happen to fit into this like information category that is really ignored. You know, a lot of people, A, don't know that these stone structures exist and B, the ones that do choose maybe <laughs> not to research it. I'm talking about archaeologists, right? I mean, there's, I'm sure, dozens of people who hike and appreciate these things and know about them, blog about them and whatnot, but very few respected professors or academics go about trying to make sense of these stone structures. And I mean, some of them are baffling, Tony. Some of them are, are just baffling. Like, for instance, the pedestal boulders that you can see uh, in New York. I'm going to show you an image real quick, and you can kind of help me describe this for the audience. But you know, there are several of these around the country, specifically in the Northeast region, and they're just massive stones, massive, massive stones that have been lifted seemingly onto these smaller stones. Now the the one with the gentleman in the red shirt underneath it, that's in North Salem, New York. And the other one that's kind of like a postcard. Uh the reason why I didn't use a photograph of the stone as opposed to the the postcard here is because this boulder has actually been moved from its original location uh and the only Evidence of its original location exists in the form of these postcards. But as you can see, you know, this giant boulder is somehow uh, propped up by these much smaller stones. And you have to wonder if maybe the Native Americans were levitating them using some kind of shamanistic power, or maybe these beings that built them weren't the Native Americans. They were these giants that the Native Americans talk so much about who, uh, you know, maybe they had a reason to build these kind of things. Maybe they had a purpose for these structures. And as I've learned more and more about these stone structures, I've started to not put as much emphasis on the physical aspects of these things and, and the actual dimensions, but the energetic quality of these stones and the immense electromagnetic energy that's being conducted when a massive heavy stone like that is propped up and pressuring, pushing, constantly pushing down on these smaller stones. It creates this energetic field, this piezoelectric force that some authors have theorized is really good for your plants. If you have some of these standing stones or pedestaled boulders in your garden, you're going to be giving off a life uh, regenerating force, a life affirming energy that's inherent to living stone. Uh, living stone not meaning that the stone's alive and thinking the same way a plant is, a uh, living stone meaning that certain types of stone actually have a magnetic or energetic force that is measurable. You can measure it with the right devices. Um, and it's not just pedestal boulders. I mean, there's so many of these amazing stone structures from stone chambers to standing stones. Obviously, we have examples of petroglyphs and uh, you know, it just makes you wonder, you know, what was going on here before the Puritans arrived. And I kind of hinted at giants. Well, here in this particular part of the country, we have the lore of a giant named Hobomok. Now, Hobomok has a variety of stories associated with him. You hear everything about 
him from, you know, he's the worst, most evil spirit to he's just a sort of misunderstood nature spirit, kind of mischievous. And then other tribes talk about him like he's kind of like a hero to a people that are are lost now. And uh, there's a story about Hobomoko who was upset at the treatment of his people and he stomped his foot down in the river, rerouting the Connecticut River. Now, this actually checks out on the <laughs> geological record and even to the human eye, you can see that the Connecticut River once flowed southward into what is the Quinnipiac River right here. Uh, and and some point in time, it took this very distinct turn east and then south towards what is now uh, the Connecticut River's mouth at Old Saybrook. But it once came down into this deep harbor here in New Haven. Now. That's the story that the natives give us. Obviously, there's an archaeological, or I'm sorry, a geological explanation for that. Uh, but you know, if that was the only story, I'd be like, okay, whatever. But there, there's more. Uh, not only did Hobomoko stomp his foot and reroute the Connecticut River, but he also um, created Sugarloaf Mountain. So, what happened with Sugarloaf Mountain is that. Back in the day, the natives were upset. This giant beaver was greedy. He was taking more than he needed. He was making life hard for the natives in the area. So they called Hobomoko. They said, please take care of this giant beaver, you know? So Hobomoko killed the giant beaver and threw his body, and his, the beaver's body became Sugarloaf Mountain. Again, you're like, okay, that's just a funny story. Well, this took place in the Connecticut River Basin, which used to be known as Lake Hitchcock. That, you know, millions of years ago, the Connecticut River was actually a glacial lake that had giant beavers in it. Go figure. There were <laughs> species of you know, prehistoric giant beavers swimming in what is now the Connecticut River. And you know, who knows how long these Native Americans have been uh, on this continent. Maybe they have some sort of experience of uh, a giant beaver species, maybe a giant beaver that was left over after the Ice Age. There are other stories about giant beavers, you know, as far west as Montana, you hear about giant beavers at the um, Flathead Lake. So it's not uncommon to hear these stories of beavers becoming mountains or having something to do with the, the damage of a lake. You know, obviously beavers are builders themselves building these sort of dams and little huts under the water. Um, but yeah, Hobomoko created this Sugarloaf Mountain and Hobomoko had a uh, brother, sometimes he's called his twin, named Moshup. And uh, there's other stories of Moshup in other parts of New England. You know, these tribes tend to you know, have similar names for the same being, but different stories of that being. Uh, so it can get a little confusing. Now, Hobomoko and Moshup, according to one story, they fought Thunderbirds. Okay. They fought these Thunderbirds and Moshup was drowned and Hobomoko was killed by lightning attacks. And Hobomoko became what is now Sleeping Giant Mountain. And as you can see from this picture, Tony, Sleeping Giant Mountain looks like a freaking man lying on his back. It just, even from the north side, the south side, you, you're driving along I-91 northward. You can see the Sleeping Giant, hence why it's named as such. And they even quarried, uh, his shoulder in the 1800s. But, uh, Hobomoko had his twin brother, Mashup, who, became what is now West Rock Mountain. And there's a whole bunch of stories about West Rock Mountain from the guys who signed King Charles's death warrant hiding there to an actual Native American sacred stone structure that you see in the left corner of the screen there. Uh, there's also a story of people doing some weird magic 
rituals <laughs> up there uh, on the top of the mountain. Uh, all kinds of weird stories from the uh, West Rock Mountain. And uh, you have to wonder, like, okay, are these mountains the bodies of ancient giants, right? It kind of sounds silly at first, but uh, when you consider that the Native Americans actually thought the pink granite that was around here was giant's flesh, and then you also take into consideration that the founding fathers specifically chose that pink granite to be a part of the Lincoln Memorial, to be a part of the base of the Statue of Liberty, and also to be a part of the White House. So, wow. <laughs> so ancient giant stone, apparent, according to natives, it's the flesh of giants and that these, you know, federal government is like yeah we need that specific type of granite it's it just you know makes you wonder like okay why what do they know about these giants right and i mean like i said there's dozens of stories about these native american giants uh you know i've only shared a few and depending on where you are in new england the, the stories do differ but it's not just giants there are actual stories of stones that eat people, that gobble people up. You'll be hiking in a certain part of New Hampshire, and if you're not careful, one of these stones might open up and pull you in. And, you know, that sounds weird. I don't think that there's like a rock monster eating people. I actually think that these stones in the right combination, in the right environment, are giving off an energy that's powerful enough to open an actual portal, okay? And when you look at these stone chambers that we find all over New England, you have to wonder if maybe there was some thought about portals when they were creating these stone chambers. Maybe these were for meditation maybe they were for astral projection maybe they were for giving birth these stone chambers are aligned to certain specific days i started thinking maybe you know maybe there's a there's the thought okay we want to have our children born at a certain time of year so we build a stone chamber this stone womb that the sun will come through this one little window on the day that, you know, it's time to conceive. And that's when we try to have a kid. And, you know, in a, in a maybe a more prehistoric culture, this would have made sense. But either way, we have these stone chambers all over the place. And it's not just the stone chambers. There's a whole series of stone structures uh, that have been described as spirit portals. Now, I'm not suggesting that these spirit portals are just, you know, lying in wait, open, you can just walk through them at any time. I think they have to be activated to a certain degree. Uh, but when you see stone structures around the um, New England forests and you see these triangle sort of um, depressions or, or cavities in between rocks, places where you can like look and see the other side, like light coming through. Those are spirit portals. Uh, what the Native Americans use them for outside of that symbolic content, context, I don't know. But there's a whole language of stone structures that once you start to identify this language, the symbols, you can start to recognize maybe the energy of the place you're in. And one thing that I'm curious about is how many of these stone structures or types of stone, you know, ceremonial sites are present or in proximity to things like Sasquatch sightings, Dogman sightings, ghost sightings, like I'm sure you're familiar with the stone tape theory where they have this idea that memories can get like 
trapped in stone or in physical objects and then somehow under the right vibration. I think you, you, you and I talked about this one time when you were on my show. Uh, and you know, the almost like a stored memory of light can get trapped in an object and then under the right vibrational circumstances, it can almost be like released out and people present will visually see that energy. You know, I think there's something like that going on and maybe the native Americans even had a somewhat of a scientific understanding of this and, and could use these stone structures reliably for that purpose. Meaning, you know, as a rite of passage, as a, a point of self-transformation, uh, or even as a, a way to heal, right? So I've said a lot. <laughs> what, what do you think, Tony? Well, I think it's fascinating. Uh, and uh, these uh, the, the, this concept, it reminds me a lot of, uh, well, I, I had Derek Olson from Megalithic Marvels on the show because uh, the one, well, the second time because, uh, of Randall Carlson and what he said on Rogan and how, like when he said it, I was just like, and everybody knows what I'm talking about by now. I mean, it was like amazing. Like he's, he's like in a few months from now, they're going to be releasing information, you know, and, and, but what he said was that they found that if you take certain shapes, put them in a certain pattern, it will it, like like I think that he said that they had actually a, they they made a generator that didn't run off electricity or anything. It, it was just fueled by these shapes in a specific pattern, and so it, it's kind of very uh, similar in a sense to what you're talking about. Where if it's placed the right the right way, uh, it could you know turn into whatever, whether it's energy or a portal or some of that, and even even along those lines of the portal aspect, um, <clears throat> it's a good thing you brought that up because. There's um, there there is a lot of uh, suspicion in, to me when it comes to the sightings and the experiences people have and what's significant, uh, geographically speaking, in those areas. Now, uh, it's not a consistent thing. There's a lot of times that you have people uh, having these experiences, and it doesn't seem like, at least on the surface, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot to go with on a geographical level. But there are, are things like. Uh, here in Tennessee, there's a certain cave that uh, is rumored to be guarded by dogmen, and that if you go into the, the the cave, it is a portal of type, and it's not like it's open all the time, kind of thing. But it is an active uh, portal location that is guarded by dogmen, and that is why people have these experiences in those areas. Uh, and so it, it's it's not a far fetched idea for me. And now, granted, you're on the show of weird, so I mean, we, <laughs> I mean, we we will talk about the the weird stuff. Um, but it, it definitely seems like there could be something there to it. Uh, and for me, it's it's like you know, it's two sides of the same coin in the sense that uh, I I definitely think that you know these creatures could be coming from multiple uh, different sources, but one of them being interdimensionality. Uh, could it be that there's some kind of traveling in between dimensions through portals? Uh, I think the ancients knew uh, a lot more than we give them credit for. Like you mentioned about how uh, the, the Native Americans, uh, but I really think that there, that there has been a time in human history where human beings had the ability to, to do things, technologically speaking, that on, to us would seem as magic, but they were so far advanced with technology and we lost that. And there's biblical references in the sense of uh, uh, the Tower of Babel, you know, like, do I think that the ancient people thought that they really could build a tower to heaven where God was? And do I think that if they really thought that God was threatened by that? No, I don't think that they, that, that they were, they were planning on building a a uh, a tower to heaven as much as I think that they were d using technology of the day that they gained from fallen angels to do things that they weren't meant to do. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. And when people talk about um, these ancient civilizations and stuff, and they don't want to bring up the biblical aspect or they want to bring the biblical aspect, nothing else. Like it, 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 to me, it's like, let's all have the same conversation. Cause I think essentially we are having the same conversation just from different vantage points. Uh, like, like this is, there, there is an ancient past here 
that we haven't even remotely come close to understanding. And uh, it, it's it's people like you going through these things and and connecting dots and stuff that uh, allows the conversation to be open. You mentioned about pseudoscience earlier, uh, like or, or no pseudo archaeology or something like that. I forget what you said, but I mean, like I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I just don't. I, I think anybody who is going off the beaten path of mainstream science, mainstream archaeology, mainstream anything is is breaking ground because that's exactly how we got to where we're at today by going off the beaten path, like mm-hmm. by forging our own path in our, in our existence, whether it's going from the East Coast of the United States and going through the wilderness of America to get to the West Coast. We've always done that. And so I don't think it's a bad thing at all. And I encourage people to do those kind of things. So I think it's really cool what you're doing and you're growing and learning from really knowledgeable people. I saw, I, I looked up when you mentioned uh, spirits in the, or st- spirits in stone. I looked at that book on, uh, on Amazon and it's forwarded by Graham Hancock. So I mean, like you're, you're, you're walking in these footsteps that people who I really respect a lot. I mean, obviously, I, I I don't agree with Graham on everything, and I don't think Graham. To be honest with you, I don't think Graham would like me very much. We had a conversation uh, because <laughs> just from what I hear from him talking and stuff, I just don't know if he would like me a whole lot. But uh, I think he's. I have a lot of respect for him, and I think that you're doing uh, something really cool that I don't think a lot of people are doing. Do you know if people are focusing on New England the way you are? Well, it's very nice of you to say that. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, there's the guy who wrote that book and and got. Graham Hancock to write the foreword. He, I believe, either founded or is a part of a group called NERA, uh, and that would be like New England Archaeological Research uh, Association or something like that. So yeah, there are there are people who are are professionals and and trained in this realm that are approaching this subject, and they've written. Uh, a few books, you know, including the ones I've mentioned. There's a few others. Uh, one by James Gage and Mary Gage that's really good that kind of is like a handbook for spotting these stone structures. They've pretty much cataloged like every type of stone structure, but they haven't found them all. And that's what's really fun for me is like the method. As I was saying before, I actually. I have a booklet available for anyone who's curious, anyone who wants to do this kind of thing themselves. It's called The Scene. That stands for the Synchromystic Exploration of the Ever-Expanding Now. And it's a very short guidebook. You can download it uh, as a PDF. And it'll give you some tips and tricks on how to get out of your normal waking consciousness and into a dreamlike state of consciousness while you're awake. And why that's important is because our reality is not fixed in the waking consciousness. It's a blend of the dream subconscious mind and the conscious mind. So when you're approaching this kind of research, you want to find something that maybe has never been found before or something that's hidden you know, why would you go about like searching for it using waking logic? It hasn't worked for anyone else. Right. Uh, it, otherwise, they would have been found already. And, you know, a few months ago or saying this it wouldn't have sounded as uh, as interesting, I guess. But now I have proof that the scene works. So uh, if I could show you um, what we found using those techniques, maybe that'll help people understand why they might want to check out my booklet not that this is some kind of plug but uh this kind of stuff is just like i said at the beginning waiting for you to find it uh and my booklet will give you some unconventional ways about searching for things but uh this is what i saw and tony's seeing this right now from the side of the road a approximately six foot tall men here uh, otherwise known as a standing stone and you usually see these kind of things in Ireland. You kind of you see these things in England. You don't typically see these in New England. So we see this giant standing stone. We pull over, and this is well into our journey of, you know, from the Manitou and other books that we've collected since. This was actually in October when we found this 
just this past year. So I find this standing stone. I pull over. As you can see, there's Tara standing next to the standing stone. It's very tall. Um, and I look beyond it, and there's this anchor shaped stone, not anchor, anvil, almost an anvil shaped stone from my first view. And I walk over to it and I realize this is a perched boulder. Now, a perched boulder is, well, it's when you see a boulder on top of another boulder. Usually the, the one on the bottom is much larger than the boulder on top of it. And as I walked around this perched boulder, I saw that from the southward facing angle, it looks kind of like a bird. <laughs> Not only is it uh, bird shaped, but the beak of the bird is facing exactly where the sun sets in the west. So this stone that's probably several tons, there's me standing next to it. Um, you know, this stone that's probably several tons just somehow landed on this much larger boulder. And it happens to be shaped like a bird. <laughs> and, you know, not only that, but it happens to be situated right there on the Hammonasset line. So, you know, here we are driving along a road that I've been down many times and look over my left shoulder and there, there it is just waiting for us to pull over and, and check it out. And this was all a few months. Or about a year after we saved a bird in this same part of the state, we found a great blue heron um, on the side of the road. And as you can see here, I kind of think that this bird stone looks like a great blue heron. Mm -hmm. And who knows? Maybe, you know, our, our synchro mystic exploration back then of saving the bird opened up this potential in the future of me finding. The bird stone, as I said earlier, you know, you, you turn your eye to nature and there are things waiting to turn their eye to you and they have gifts and it's not scary. You know, I, we're, we're so wrapped up in survivalism that we, we think the woods is this evil place and it can be. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You can die in the woods. There are dangerous things going on, but. Nature itself is not this evil cannibalistic force. It's just not, at least in my experience. People may have, uh, <laughs> have experiences that differ, but here's the Hammonasset line on the right there, Tony, for you. And, uh, and there's the stone structure. It, it's right there somewhere. I don't want to be too specific about, uh, where it is, but just for your eyes, you could see the map. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this, there's a history of, of these bird stones, you know, Native Americans have been carving these types of things, uh, hand sized bird stones for, you know, thousands of years. And here's this giant bird stone just waiting there for us to find. And I think it also kind of is shaped like the big dipper. Uh, that's a little bit of a stretch, but, you know, considering it's, astronomically aligned who knows maybe it maybe it's has a, a larger truth that it's portraying uh, something about the seasons or or who knows i'd like to go there at night to see what the sky looks like uh, from above or from the base of this uh, bird stone but yeah it, it's a journey that we've been on for a while now and uh I still have a lot more questions than I do answers. Um, you know, places like the Newport Tower or the Kensington Rune Stone, you know, certainly make you think like Templars or some group were over here building stuff. And when you see a, a big standing stone like that, and it, it kind of reminds me of uh, what they have going on in England. You know, we have all these magical places and, you know, all of the lore surrounding those places is fairies and leprechauns. And over here, we have the little people too. They, they just go by different names like, uh, the Pukwaji or the No Homo, uh, <laughs> No Homo. The, uh, uh <laughs> edit that out, Tony. Um, <laughs> we have, we have the, uh, um, Naka, Nakomo. 
is what they are called. There's there's a few different names for these creatures, but uh, you know it's all it's all mirrored over here in in New England, just like it is over there in Old England. Um, you don't hear as much about the Thunderbird over there, but have you ever heard of uh, the being Americus, Tony? Do you know about this story, Americus? No. So the name America comes from allegedly uh, Ameru or Americas. This is a dragon. This is a, a feathered serpent like Quetzalcoatl, right? So Quetzalcoatl was not the only feathered serpent. There was actually a feathered serpent uh, named America. That's where America gets its name, believe it or not. Um, we have all these cultures that have visited the Americas from the Chinese to some nations in Africa to some European nations from the Norse to the Welsh. And I started to think about this over the past few days. Why is it that all these cultures that have the symbol of the dragon, not every culture has this dragon symbol, Every culture has a snake. Sure, some of them have flying snakes, but only a few specific cultures have this dragon symbol. And from what I understand, those very same cultures that have the dragon symbol are cultures that have been to America before Columbus at some point in their history. I'm starting to think maybe the reason why all these cultures are using that symbol of the dragon they came to America at some point in ancient history and they don't want to share all the information about this, you know, whole land of resources and whatnot. So they encode it into myth with this story of the dragon. Uh, and the Native Americans may have called this dragon the Thunderbird. It may be a different being than the Thunderbird. I mean, you heard that story I told earlier about the Thunderbird hitting the giants with lightning bolts and turning them into mountains. I mean, in a different context, we could be talking about like a UFO battle there or, or some kind of mystical war, you know? And I think we have to be able to look at these ancient stories with that modern lens and also maybe with an ancient lens and kind of be flexible about our interpretation. But it's just... It doesn't seem like a coincidence that all of these peoples who have been to the Americas named after this dragon have this dragon symbol. I mean, not many people know that the Chinese uh, possibly were the Olmec because their explorations of the Americas line up with when the Olmecs arrived in Mexico. Um, there's also evidence that shows that the Chinese may have introduce the virus that wiped out the mound builders people are starting to uh, theorize that you know the reason why the mound builders were all gone was because there was some kind of uh, plague that hit, hit them several hundred years before the spanish arrived that's why they entered cahokia and it was just this empty city well it could possibly be because of this uh this earlier wave of explorers from the far east or uh, you know far west depending on your perspective right, right. Uh, there's also this incredible similarity between the cultures in the inca the incan culture in peru with japanese you know culture from the pottery to the symbology to even the language and the same thing goes with Chinese and Olmec. There are similarities between the written language and even some of the the um, contexts in which, like conjugate conjugation of verbs and that kind of thing. You know, you can. I'm not a linguist, but if if you trace those certain mechanics of the language back, they're overlapping the Chinese and the Olmec. So, who knows? Again. This is all mystery, but it's all kind of started for me at Mystery Hill, fast, you know, reverse back, you know, before Tara and I went to Woodstock. Two years before that, my friend Jay and I were listening to, um, well, we were listening to the guy from Missing 411 on a little road trip from Maine, from back from Maine to Connecticut. And I said, oh, 
we're not too far from Mystery Hill. Let's stop over there. And we stopped over Mystery Hill for people who don't know is also called American Stonehenge. And back then I had no clue, no context. All I knew is that this thing was called Stonehenge. And uh, we didn't end up going and hiking it. We just went into the little museum area that where they have some of the artifacts displayed. And it's funny how like hindsight, you can like see all this stuff, but like when you're actually there or for me, when I was there, you know, I was just looking at rocks. I I wasn't thinking about what these things actually were. Um, And now I'm with everything I know, I'm like, holy crap, like that planted the seed for what I'm doing right now. Seeing that, you know, Viking rune uh, on a stone that they found in New Hampshire, you know, that imprinted itself in my mind. And now I've been, you know, unraveling all of this stuff. Uh, not only did they have, you know, strange inscriptions on rocks, they had these stones called Manitou stones. And the Manitou stones were stones that were shaped in the silhouette of a human man. So there would be like a sort of head and shoulders. And if you have a, a keen eye, Keep your eyes open next time you're on a hike. If you live in the Northeast or even anywhere else in the United States, I'm sure they have these stones all over the place. They just haven't been noticed. But keep your eyes open. If you ever see a very distinct shape of a head and shoulders kind of shaped stone, almost like a like a, a oven kind of, what are the, the wooden things you put in your oven, you know, a paddle, a pizza maker thing. Kind of looks like that shape. That's a Manitou stone. And, you know, under the right circumstances, you may be able to uh, open up a portal with that Manitou stone. Uh, I found a a Manitou stone that was shaped like a human head. Uh, I could show you a picture of it. It's kind of funny to look at. But uh, all of these are just waiting in the forest under under leaf cover, you know, slowly being taken by the roots. Uh, they're just out there waiting for people to come and, and, and discover them. And I think the most important thing for me that I've learned over the past year is that we need to begin to cherish and revere our earth. You know, our earth is created by our creator, our redeemer, and you know, it says in the Bible that we need to be stewards of the land. And I think by being stewards of the land, we need to recognize all of the different aspects from the rocks to the trees to the birds and the animals and everything else in between, you know, and, and really have take responsibility for our role in those beings' lives and their roles in ours, you know, because for a long time humans have had this kind of perspective of like it's ours for the taking or it's ours to make the most of but i think that inflex that mindset that that materialist mindset is only going to lead to uh more problems you know the kind of problems we're seeing in society are just an outgrowth of our wrong relationship with each other. And that's an outgrowth of our wrong relationship with the earth, really. And I don't mean to sound all hippie on you, but, you know, as somebody who was raised Catholic and kind of moved away from the Bible and then came back to Christianity through, you know, my own research and my own, you know, finding. Uh, there are parts of the Bible that have really spoke to me, and you're so- seeing the Manitou stone now, Tony. This is the one that's shaped like a face. But there are certain parts of the Bible that have spoke to me about this, you know, particular concept that we're talking about when it comes to being a steward of the of the land and 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 uh, taking care of this earth. Right? I, I think the stones. They're not, (laughs) 
even though the Puritans went around naming them, oh, devil's tombstone and devil's furnace and all this devil stuff. I really, I, I think that that was just like a superstitious thing. Like we really, as, as Christians today, shouldn't, um, you know, shouldn't think of these natural ceremonial sites as evil. Uh, we should think of them as cathedrals of the forest, places where we can commune with God through nature. And I think that's what the Native Americans were doing. And, you know, there are so many mysterious aspects to Christianity, like the miracles and these great healing events and prophecies. Well, all of those things happened amongst the Native Americans too. It's just they didn't have the Bible, you know. They 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 had all of the the same kind of relationship qualities with their God that many Christians wrote about having. So, I think when when we can get over that sort of materialist reflex that we have as human beings, uh, we'll start to see. Beings like the dog man and the Sasquatch and the moth man, I think we'll see them fade out. And I think we'll see beings like the leprechaun and the elf and the gentler strange beings being more present. You know, not that the elves are all good because I know there's all those stories about the elves kidnapping kids and I'm not all, I'm not about that. Okay. Don't touch my kids. Don't touch Tony's kids or anyone's kids. Stay away from our kids, elves. Uh, but I do think that, that these animals, these strange fringe beings, I think they're more a part of the environment than we give credit. And I think the environment is this living being that has the ability to manifest a creature like a Bigfoot if it needs to, to sort of correct the relationship that humans have with the environment. I mean, think about it. Native, uh, Native Americans, they had a lot of respect for Bigfoot. They would leave him be. Um, now people go in the woods and. Bigfoot throws a damn rock at your head and what what happens? You run you run to your car and you go call Tony and tell him what happened, you know? Like I think there's a certain truth to that of of uh of like, you know, these beings are are reminding us what we're supposed to be as human beings. Uh and maybe that means, you know, staying out of the the big wild wilderness for a little while. Give it enough time uh, in space to recuperate before we go back into it and, and take whatever we want. Cause we've been taken, taken, taken for a long time. And I think that, uh, you know, again, not trying to sound like a hippie on a soapbox here, but I, I think that, uh, a lot of these paranormal strange phenomena are like mother nature responding to our sort of ignorance about this energy relationship we have with the environment, you know, and it's not any one person's fault. It's a, it's a combination of everybody's sort of combined efforts. Uh, all of these cities and electro smog signals. I mean, it all has a detrimental effect that's gradual. And as that effect becomes more, you know, gra- it graduates more and more up the the scale. We're going to see an equal and opposite response from Mother Nature, and maybe that takes the form of like weird phenomena, you know, un- unexplained phenomena. Maybe that's how Mother Nature s- sets the balance back. What do you think, Tony? That's an interesting concept. I never really even heard that before, uh, but it's definitely an interesting concept. I think that. Um, I think the what you just kind of laid out today is uh, a reason for people to have a newfound respect for nature, but also when they're out there to look around and keep your eyes open. A new, a new reason to discover mysteries that are buried in our history out there. Uh, you know, like a lot of times people, you know, that listen to my show when they go out hiking, the first thing they're thinking is, "Well, man, I wonder if the Bigfoot's out here." Or, I hope there's no dog man out here, uh, but maybe they start looking around and the very rocks that they're hopping over looking for Bigfoot might be the treasure they've been looking for the entire time. And uh, I, I think that what you just did today was uh, kind of 
hopefully spark that new found interest in our past and the symbols and the the leftovers that are there. I, what I'm going to do is uh, the PDF you were referencing I have here with all the pictures and stuff. I'm going to post that with the uh, episode description. Uh, and that way people can check if that's all right with you. I'm assuming you, you did, you did say people can look it up, right? Yeah. Let me, uh, I'll send you the links cause there's two, there's two PDFs people can purchase from me. And then there's photos that I don't mind sharing with you. If you want to, um, give like the listeners some context some visual context, but the PDF itself, uh, that's, those are available. Uh, on my Ko-Fi store, I can give you a link to that. I have the Scene Edition One, which describes my method of searching this stuff out and like how to kind of go about exploring. And it's a fun travel guide because it's a travel guide that doesn't, it's not limited to any one place like most travel guides. You could use this travel guide anywhere you are. Uh, and then the Scene Two is basically like, again, like proof of concept, right? Like I basically show, uh, all of the things that we found using those, uh, those methods in short time too. I mean, it was only, it's only been a year since the first one was published and, and, and yeah, I, I, I'm just so happy to be a part of this community. Tony, you've been so kind to me on my podcast, joining me several times and your audience has been awesome. I've, I've, Definitely, you know, receive some folks from your audience who listen to my show now. And, uh, even a guy who's been, a, you know, two or three people have been a guest on your show, Appalachian Intelligence and Seb Bland, uh, have been guests on my show. So I love being a part of this community with you, brother. I love, uh, trailing or, uh, blazing this trail, you know, that we're all blazing in the podcast community. And, and yeah, I think, you know, as far as the stone symbols go, there are so many things you can look for, folks. I mean, from chambers to cairns to pedestaled boulders. I mean, there are so many. What really, I haven't even mentioned the stone walls, but the stone walls were really what kind of kept reminding me because there are so many. I mean, you're from Pennsylvania. You've you've seen these stone walls. They have them down there in Pennsylvania, uh, but they're everywhere up here, like in front of people's yards and you know, to me, when I see them, I don't think farms, I don't think colonies. I think, you know, this is the, this is the spine of the Native American landscape because, well, there's plenty of evidence that shows that they, uh, in fact, built all of those stone walls and, and the colonists just kind of came along and, uh, added to it. But anyways, there's so much to find, man. There's so much to find out there. And, and, uh, you know, just be careful if you're out there exploring, you know, there, <laughs> some, sometimes these sites can have uh spooky aspects to them for sure. There's a reason why they call this spooky archaeology. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, throughout history and stuff, especially like these ancient rock structures and stuff, people who have settled into areas, I mean, they, they use them, they, they look, they view them as spiritual places Anywhere from Native Americans to, you know, witches having, you know, seances and stuff. And so, uh, the, these places are, are talked about holding energy, but then the very energy that people brought to them spiritually could be, uh, still retained there as well. So, uh, definitely spooky is a understatement for some of these places for sure. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to getting out more and more myself. Uh, once Jack gets down here, he like I, I've been chomping at the bit because him and I were supposed to be doing all these like YouTube videos where we go out, you know, just to these areas and do like an action vlog, self filming kind of thing. And uh, I had to go mess it up and move to Tennessee. And so <laughs> uh, I, it, but uh, he's he's now uh, moving down here with me and to work with with me and for me. So. Um, when he gets down here, though, one of the things we're going to jumpstart is the effort on the video front of things. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think throughout my entire career uh, podcasting, I've neglected the video side of things a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, it's because I, I just, I'm not good at everything. And I especially am not good at everything operating uh, expeditiously. I, I'm, I'm, I can kind of be very slow when it comes to the video stuff. So, the idea of taking that on was too daunting. 
but now that I have an extra set of hands, we're going to start trying to do more video stuff when it comes to the show, creating maybe some live news segments on the YouTube channel where we go over you know news articles from the, the blog that my wife posts to... I'd love to be a field reporter where you guys are just like, and now we're going to patch in Mark and you just play like a three minute video of me in like a field. Like I found another stone structure. <laughs> I found another rock guys. <laughs> Back to you in the studio. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I mean, like part of that is going out, you know, we have the smoky mountains right here. I mean, I literally can see the smoky mountains from my house every day. Every day I drive by them as long as it's not cloudy. I see the layers upon layers. I'm like, what kind of mysteries are out there? Well, I'll tell you what, all those smoky mountains are made of quartz, as far as I've learned. Uh, and quartz is, is definitely one of these energetic capacitors, you know, it's just beaming with energy, pulling it in, sending it out. The whole Appalachian mountains are, are a form of crystalline quartz. But, uh, I did po- want to point out before we let each other go here. There are so many petroglyphs, and I loved that interview you did with the Appalachian intelligence guys, uh, but I wanted to point one out to you in case you didn't know. Have you ever heard of the Bat Creek Stone from Bat Creek, Tennessee? No. Please talk to me. <laughs> right on. So in Tennessee, they found this really strange stone with what looks like runic carvings on it, uh, and you can find it. Most likely, hopefully, in Bat Creek, Tennessee. I don't know how far that is from you, but uh, maybe that's that'll be a subject of uh, exploration uh, on one of your video journeys. Maybe you guys could go see what else is over there in Bat Creek. <laughs> wow, I, I guess I'm supposed to talk here. I, I'm, I'm looking at it online. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, no, I... I have never heard of it, and I'm trying to figure out where exactly it is. Okay, so Loudoun County. Hmm. Not far from Loudoun County. So, okay. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I think I'm still learning the counties. In, in Tennessee, they put a lot more emphasis on counties than they did in Pennsylvania. Uh, mm. You know, like, it, like when I get, when I get into my county, like, it just it feels different. The vibes different because the, the the way they just do things, the way they they govern down here is a lot different than in Pennsylvania. Well, um, that's a lot to do with the sheriff, I imagine, right? A lot, yeah. I, I've never seen so many sheriffs in my entire life, man. Like they're they're everywhere. You got the town police, you got the sheriff everywhere. Every time I drive somewhere, I'm seeing a police officer of some sort. It's uh, they're they're all over. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it's. I, I dig it. I love living here. Uh, I'm gonna t- I'm gonna check this out for sure. Uh, Mark, before we get out of here, tell people again where they can find all your stuff, uh, podcast, PDF, all that stuff. And I will leave links in the description of this episode as well. Thank you. Yeah, it's in the description, folks. But uh, if you have trouble finding it, you can find it at myfamilythinksomecrazy.com. Uh, you'll also find my podcast there you can listen to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and uh youtube rockfin we're on all of the uh sort of support platforms like patreon if you guys are so kind to do so uh we really appreciate it so yeah tony thank you so much brother i have like four podcasts i do so i'm not going to plug them all i'll just say go to my family thinks i'm crazy.com and you'll see all of the shows i do yeah, go there, and then from there you can navigate your path as you choose. So, yeah, check awesome. it out, everybody. My family thinks I'm crazy, Mark. It's been a blast. Mm-hmm.